back. I appreciate two seminars in one day. That's a pretty busy day. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Devereaux. Um, Richard's a longtime collaborator of mine uh, from the US EPA Office of Research and Development Lab over in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Uh, Richard got his, uh, his bachelor's from St. Thomas, which is in Houston, and then he did his PhD at the University of Houston with uh, George Fox, who if you don't know, he was one of the co-discoverers of, of archaea, so kind of a big name in microbiology. And then Richard postdoc with uh, Dave Stahl, who is also, you know, one of the, the really big guys still. He's uh, Richard postdoc at University of Illinois. And then he's been a research microbiologist at EPA since 1991. And I think we have a really interesting seminar today about some work that he's done in the Gulf of Mexico looking at sediment biogeochemistry and some of the microbial uh, populations that, that are influenced by hypoxia in that system. Okay. Welcome, Richard. Great. Thank you, John. I have this. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I want to make sure this is working. Okay. So, thank you. So this is work uh, that we did in the Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone. So we're working, this is going to be purely sediments. And John and I worked on the sediment portion of a much larger project, uh, basically to develop the tools and models to predict uh, the timing and extent and duration of hypoxia to help uh, see if we can regulate um, the occurrence of that. Um, and that's the that's the boat we use. It's the uh, the it was the bowl the EPA um, subse yeah, subsequently uh, got rid of it. So there, all right. You okay? Give me that. My apologies. I got you. Thank you. Okay. So I guess I would never be a, a country western star. That thing. So I look like golf. Garth Brooks. Okay. Okay. So here's uh, here's an outflow from the Gulf of Mexico uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. It, the shelf gets uh, river sediments from the Mississippi Natchitoya River basin. It basically drains a central third of the continental U.S. And you can see there's uh, it's very silty and, and muddy. Um, uh, so it delivers uh, 172 million tons of sediment a year, uh, 4 million tons of organic carbon. And I think the important things here are, are the manganese and iron, and they're going to have a big influence on the, the sediment uh, biogeochemistry in the Gulf. So we wanted to focus on that part of it. And this one. And it's important because... Um, uh, the organic carbon uh, decomposition processes regulate uh, the amount of carbon in the shelves that are buried or, or the amount of CO2 that goes up. And 80% of the carbon that comes from the land mass into the, continent, into the ocean is uh, degraded on these continental shelves. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, hypoxic area, 25 to 60% of the oxygen consumption that leads to hypoxia uh, can be done by the sediments. Uh, there was, when we started this, there was a lack of biogeochemical parameters for sediments in the hypoxic zone. And this will also help with uh, understanding and regulating uh, the toxicity of sediments that arises, uh, you know, during uh, like eutrophication uh, generated by sulfide. So we can look at those things uh, in this study. In sediments, um, the rest this uh, chain of respiratory processes, and they start with uh, the most energetically favorable one, which is oxygen. They transition through uh, nitrate reduction, uh, uh, nitrate respiration, or the chemical zone here is called the nitrogenous zone. This is some um, terminology proposed by Canfield and Thandrup. Uh, typically, in the past, the chemical zones where you have all the 
the nitrogen, manganese, and iron cycling going on was just referred to as suboxic. But there's a lot more going on there than could be defined by just calling it one particular zone. So after that, then, end up with sulfate reduction. And uh, uh, sulfate reduction is a primary and often dominant pathway in marine sediments because the sulfate is so plentiful. Then after the carbon and the electron acceptors get used up, finally it goes to sulfate reduction. And more typically in freshwater sediments where there's no sulfate, the terminal process is uh, methanogenesis. So CO2.
Okay. So zone two, this is getting closer to the business end of the hypoxic zone. Um, so in the DIC in September, it's kind of like at the end of hypoxia, uh, this station I think was hypoxic then, but a lot of DIC, that indicates a lot of more microbial respiration than there was in April. Uh, it could be from, you know, in the, a lot of organic matter depositing on the sediments. Uh, you can see it deeper in the sediments, the uh, poor water concentrations of reduced iron were higher. So it kind of suggests that, you know, again, indicates iron reduction, uh, again, chemical or microbial. Um, and the manganese in the poor water during then was lower. We kind of would expect maybe it was higher. The uh, reduced manganese is soluble. And under a hypoxic conditions, it'll, it'll build up in the sediment and then start to diffuse out. So that could explain the lower concentrations there. Uh, big changes in the uh, uh, reduced and oxidized iron. So as, uh, um, so in June and September, sediments had a lot more reduced iron than in April. And you can see over there, the uh, next to that, the amount of oxidized iron has gone down as with hypoxia and basically the ratio uh, more reduced iron than uh, oxidized iron uh, during hypoxia. Now zone three. I think what's really telling about this one is uh, this wasn't hypoxic at the time of the samplings, but over on uh, the top right for the, the manganese concentrations during, uh, you know, later in the um, later in the season during, you know, when, when the waters are more hypoxic, the manganese is up, and um, so kind of, you know, suggests there's more uh, organic matter being deposited there, but it's not really at that point the sediments aren't really becoming you know, like, like more anaerobic to where, where the uh, um, uh, sulfate reduction might be important. Uh, and again, in the bottom, uh, just like in zone two, you see the, uh, an increase in the reduced iron and a loss of the oxidized iron and then um, more in the ratio, uh, more reduced iron showing up. Okay, so here's our basically our sulfate reduction rates over this time. We've been missing uh, some of the pore water for one of the samplings, but um, for zone two, you can see that the sulfate reduction rates are the highest. Those are the open circles. They're the highest when the manganese and the iron, the uh, black and the little squares, were lowest. So again, the depletion of the iron and, and the manganese uh, gives rise to uh, increased sulfate reduction rates. And again, at, here at zone three, it seems like the manganese is really important there in uh, controlling whether or not the sulfate reduction rates are going to increase at that time. And um, uh, this would have been 2009, I think. Um, but we focused on trying to tease out some of the electron accepting processes rather than cutting up the cores. And we measured uh, sulfate reduction rates here, but we also took sediments and uh, uh, collected fractions. We homogenized them in the glove bag under nitrogen, we put them in a, a 50 mil centrifuge tube and tubes and set those at, um, uh, in an incubator at the, the temperature of the, the water. We let those go for say up to 36 hours. And then we, uh, uh, took the pull, centrifuge those pulled off the pore water and looked at the changes in the concentration of iron and manganese to get a, a handle on, on iron and manganese reduction rates. And here, so zone two up at the top, this is the one that's again more, it's in the central part of the uh, hypoxic zone, it doesn't get all the iron and manganese that the station further to the east gets. In August of 2007, over on the left, 
you see the, the black triangles, that's during hypoxia. So the sulfate reduction rates were much higher than during April. Um, the iron concentrations in the poor water picked up. And here, the manganese concentrations were always low. And you compare that to zone three, and that's the one where we had a lot of manganese showing up. But again, there's no real change in uh, sulfate reduction rates between the spring and the summer. Uh, the poor water iron increases still from the summer, and then also the, the manganese. So it's driving, you know, the electron acceptors are moving uh, maybe towards more iron, but they haven't quite made it down to sulfate reduction rates yet. All right, All right so we calculate uh, the percent of electron acceptors that contribute to the decomposition of organic matter. And basically with this, you can, the assumption is that uh, the DIC flux, and this is what, what John, John measured these, but uh, the DIC flux, uh, the percent of the DIC attributable to electron uh, acceptors would be the uh, sediment oxygen consumption. And the one-to-one -one there has to do with the stoichiometry of oxygen reduced per carbon oxidized. And then sulfate reduction rates. Uh, take two sulfates to get one uh, CO2. And then down in the denominator, uh, said 75, 25% of the DIC flux is due to respiration. The rest of it is like chemical reaction. And so oxygen, and you add up the oxygen and CO2, and you get pretty much uh, most of the uh, organic matter decomposition in zone two most of the time is by sulfur reduction. But at one point in 2006, even during hypoxia, the rates were low. And um, so we got, still got about 58% that we could attribute to another, the other pathways. And at zone three, it was always um, 28 to 60 percent of uh, respiration could be due to uh, oxygen and sulfate reduction. And then manganese and iron reduction, um, 42 percent at zone two, and then maybe up to 72 percent at zone three. So this was uh, really new inf information there. Like I said, it had never been looked at before. We did a, uh, we had a, got to do a little bit of work with microbial communities and 16 sRNAs. Uh, in the lower right hand corner, uh, those are the April 2006 cruises. Um, the numbers that face, this is a redundancy analysis. The distribution of the numbers are the sediment depths for that particular cruise. Uh, when the, um, uh, during April, those are all towards the lower right of this plot. And then in uh, September, they're up to the upper left. And you can, uh, basically the, uh, uh, the abundances of the 16 sRNA are, are analyzed kind of like a regression analysis on top of the environmental variables. And this shows that the control of the microbial communities, those are basically all sulfate reducers. So when, uh, during hypoxia, when the sediments are reduced, the uh, sulfate reducing community uh, kind of comes up. All right, then we developed this model, kind of a conceptual model, and we have DO at the top, organic matter flux at the bottom, and manganese, iron concentrations, and then sulfate reduction rates. So this is what we think goes on, that uh, in the winter you have you know, high concentrations of manganese and iron. Um, as the organic loads increase during hypoxia and the, wa and the uh, oxygen concentrations decrease, those get used up, they don't get regenerated, and then the sulfate reduction rates become much more important. And then when the hypoxia dis dissipates, the sediments get reoxidized, so it returns to, to that more oxidized state. 
So for our hypothesis then, I think we show that the manganese and, uh, and the iron are important uh, electron acceptors. And that, yeah, this, you know, the sulfur reduction rates are higher during hypoxia than when the concentrations look normal. We did a big cruise in, in 2010. And following up on, on that work, we want to suggest, see whether uh, the benthic infauna colonization on the shelf, uh, it very well that it'll vary over, over the shelf because of the different depositions and, and mixing regimes that go on. Uh, the biogeochemical pathways for the organic matter decomposition are also going to vary over the spatial extent of the hypoxic zone, along with uh, the in fauna. And that the variation that we see is going to have uh, more pattern of more near shore to offshore, this was one of John's uh, proposals, then um, east to west from the uh, outflow westward. And that was one of the, the models that uh, people working on hypoxia were putting forward as what regulates hypoxia. But we, we think it might be different. All right, so the mixing out there. Uh, 90% of the sediments that come out settle within 50 kilometers of the outfall. 5% uh, of what's left goes across the shelf, still a lot. Uh, the sediments on the, across the shelf are 80% mud, so they're very loose. Uh, there's a sandy shoal south of Atchalaya Bay. Uh, and for the, the longshore currents, we'll continually resuspend and redistribute the fine sediments, the superficial sediments. Uh, and the sediments near shore, they're called relics, so they've, they've settled a long time ago. And they're, they have a lot of clay, and they, they're, they're mixed, but they're really very old, you know, from based on the lead tube and dating. And what happens is the, you know, the sediments just get swept, new sediments get swept off. Uh, Okay, and then the waves, just you know, just normal waves, they'll pick up and resuspend uh, basically a few millimeters of sediment. And then the big mixers are, I guess, you know, the hurricane and tropical storms. These are two different studies, but one study says uh, they'll take eight centimeters of sediment and waters 25 meters deep and move those around. And then when you get out to 40, 40 meters deep, it's, it's a little less. And then this other study said that basically uh, a uh, strong storm can take off 15 centimeters of sediment and move it around, and that's equivalent to the amount of sediment that comes down the river in a year. So it's uh, yeah, some pretty massive processes out there mixing the sediments. All right, so we had 12, 12, 12 stations. Those are shown here. Again, they're, they're set up so we can address east to west versus inshore, offshore changes or patterns. We used uh, uh, a sediment profiling imaging camera. This is uh, basically a camera that's mounted on a, on a big metal frame. The camera sits inside uh, plexiglass. It has a wedge shape that when you drop this down to the sediment, it pushes the wedge into the sediment, and then the camera takes a picture of the sediment on the, the face plate. This is really useful because um, you can actually see what the sediment wor looked like. And you really don't, you know, if you pull up a core and start cutting it, you don't really get that kind of, of view of it. It's all, you know, it's just all mud. Um, so it shows really a lot of the variation in, in the sediment. So the column, the A column is the, the stations closest to the delta. And C, uh, you know, then going west. And then from top to bottom or inshore to offshore. You see all of the, most of the black sediments occur inshore, and the black sediments are indicative of sulfate reduction. So you get the sulfide precipitates on your sulfide, which is black. Uh, the white things up there would be like carbonates, but also the clays that are capping the, these older sediments. Um, also notice at FO4 that uh, uh, there's more black sediments, and there's not 
like the clays or the, you know, the other things that we have on the inshore. When you start moving offshore then, then let's see, so AO2, the second image, the kind of the roughness of the, the clay layer, that that's points to physical mixing. And so then in the central, uh, again, closer to the, the delta, the, the sediments are a little oranger, so more, they're more oxidized. Uh, CO2, a little more reduced. You know, it's not as reduced as inshore, but you can see some reduction. And then on the, the western parts, for example, in uh, FO7 there, you can see uh, uh, like the orange streak coming down, so that's probably a bioturbator that's oxidizing that sediment and showing, you know, the ox oxygen being pushed down and helping the biogeochemistry. Then the, all the offshore ones on the bottom, again, they're all well oxidized, a little bit of, of sulfide over in AO7. These arrows, for example, over at CO7, there, there's a void. And it's probably some kind of, you know, a worm that had lived, was living down there, kind of caught the end of the, its burrow. Um, then over here on the right, um, the HO8 image too, see the uh, kind of the disruption in, of the sediments. They, they, uh, it's called a puzzle fragment, puzzle sediments. And those, that's really, that kind of structure is really indicative of, of mixed sediments, all right? So the, the kind of like the physical mixing of the sediments. So we see that, examples of that in, uh, in those sediments, some up at HO3. Uh, so again, this kind of, this points to the physical mixing of the sediment. Um, I think I have that here. All right, so a colleague of ours at an EPA lab in Narragansett looked at these pictures. And uh, so he looks at the pictures and then he counts what kinds of worms he sees, the, the in fauna, based on, on the pictures, and um, different kinds, and there are different indexes to um, categorize the, basically the, the stress level that the sediments are under. Um, so here's this table. Uh, the first most uh, left column is, is ARPD, that's the apparent redox potential discontinuity. And that was where you saw the sediments become black, so it changes from orange to black. Um, the depth of that is important. It's indicative of sediment mixing, you know, or you know, either from, from the mud or, or the worms, and also organic matter decomposition are gonna control that. The inshore stations like AO2, CO2, FO4, and HO3, they're all small. Uh, they go like, like from two to three centimeters. When you start getting offshore then, like AO7, C11, FO8, and HO8, they're nearer over 10 centimeters. So there's more mixing going on there, and the sediments are more oxidized. The uh, OSI, BHQ, BHQ fauna, and CMEX diversity are indexes he derives from counting uh, the, the critters. Um, the first two on the left include uh, the ARPD as a factor, and the other on the right are just uh, straight up what kind of organisms are there and how many. Um, there's not a lot of, there's not a big range in those, and it basically just says that the, the sediments out there are just in general stress, you know, so the benthic fauna habitat is one that's just generally stressed. Um, these are chlorophyll A profiles in the sediments. Again, for all of our, our stations, the black dots are the chlorophyll concentrations that we measure. This says you can use uh, the chlorophyll A concentrations to estimate how deep the sediments are mixed and how rapidly they're mixed. So it's uh, basically a curve, um, the least squares analysis to fit the, the model to the curve and need to account for the 
decomposition or the decay constant for the chlorophyll in the sediment. So that's going to change over time. The chlorophyll is going to get uh, degraded, and so you have to account for that. And what we show here then, the, the line, uh, the horizontal dashed line is the ARPD. And inshore, the, uh, again, the, the sediments are very mixed very shallow. Uh, we didn't uh, estimate a, a mixing coefficient for the, the two central ones because the upper layers are just so, so mixed. It's hard to start there. And similarly, uh, like AO5 and AO7, kind of, this is where all the, most of the sediments are kind of coming out of the, the river and settling, settling down. You can see there's like a, almost like a biphasic curve to those. It kind of suggests like two sedimentation events. It could be two different seasons. So in the spring with the, the rains, you get a lot of water coming down with a lot of mud. And that, that could represent that. Uh, the other ones, um, uh, more in the central. So we can compare like uh, HO3 and AO2 is uh, 33 and, and 68 versus offshore. We have 148, 170, and, and 93 over there. The ones in the middle are somewhat intermediate. So uh, mixing and in, in inshore is low. It's mainly physical. And then as you move offshore, you see um, uh, these deeper mixing layers, and that's because of the bioturbation. So there were, you know, our colleagues showed that uh, the inshore stations were very poorly colonized within fauna. And then when you get offshore, again, related to the ARPD as well, that there's more in fauna and the, the mixing of the sediments is higher. And I, so if we go back to the, to the earlier set of data, the sediments uh, kind of reoxidize, and I was always wondering about how that, that might be. And basically, if you go back and look, the uh, profiles basically are getting mixed. Uh, so this mixing basically accounts for, I think, the reoxidation of the sediments between the hypoxic periods. So I think that explains how that can happen. All right, so more profiles. Uh, so it's from 12 stations. Um, so AO7, this is like the, the furthest off, offshore one. Uh, the left column are, is uh, uh, the four water iron, manganese, and uh, DIC. The manganese is a triangle. And there, um, offshore, uh, close to the river, the manganese is high. Again, it's over 300 micromolar. Um, Lots of uh, oxidized iron is the orange. Uh, the reduced iron is the yellow, so a whole bunch of oxidized iron. Sulfate reduction rates are, in, are the red. They're low. And the green are the, uh, the organic matter. So you have a lot of organic matter, low sulfate reduction, and uh, lots of iron and, and manganese. And then getting into CO2, an inshore station, um, High sulfate reduction rates about in the middle of the core. Um, there's a dip in the, uh, basically in both of the metals. I think this might be that um, the metals here are, are called high, highly reactive. They're extracted basically with, uh, you know, like, like uh, uh, something like one, about equivalent of one molar HCl. So if you start getting iron like pyrite, you know, those don't come out so much. You need something much stronger. So these are the highly reactive irons. They're the irons the bacteria like. So it's probably a lot of iron precipitation there that we can't extract. Um, so the sulfate reduction rates are low in the sediment. The manganese is up high. Manganese concentration is high. Um, here's another good example. Um, so we have on CO6, you can see the uh, Four water iron peaks at about uh, three, three centimeters, and then the, the sulfur reduction rates peak just below that. So, so the iron gets used up, and then the uh, 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 the sulfur reducers then, you know, are, are have a competitive advantage, and they'll they'll start cranking. Uh, yep. So similar at CO6. 
score profiles. Uh, these are basically the, the same. FO4 here um, has outstanding uh, uh, sulfate reduction rates. They're actually off the chart. Those were where the sediments were really black. Um, the uh, pore water, iron and manganese drop down to probably maybe sulfide precipitation. Um, there's a, a dip in the uh, iron concentrations that, that fall below that. And that's good. Then FO7 is bioturbated sediment, um, but only in the, the top part, uh, or is the oxidized iron most abundant? More profiles. Um, yeah, this is good. So HO, HO4. So a small peak of iron and manganese up top, uh, some oxidized iron, and then below that, there's uh, high sulfate reductions at the surface sediment. They, then they come back up in the sediment. So it shows how uh, uh, the iron concentrations are basically controlling uh, the sulfate reduction rates, and there's more oxidized iron offshore. This is a, a principal component analysis of the sediment biogeochemical parameters, and the, the green circles are uh, significant clusters of stations that we was determined by a clustering analysis and a, a, a SIMPROF to, for significance at 95% uh, level. AO7 and AO5 over here on the left, those are uh, uh, the stations closest to the, the delta that get a lot of fresh iron and manganese. FO8, C11, and HO8 are the offshore sediments. Uh, the rest of them are inshore in the middle. There's, if you look at like FO4 and CO2, they're at the, the top of that big group. And then it works down to AO2 and CO6, kind of the intermediate and then FO7 uh, at the bottom with HO4, so those are the oxid more oxidized stations. And HO3 was a real oddball. That's, that's just out of, the, out of the picture. It had a lot, of, a lot of shells and sand, and the chemistry was really different. All right, so we can group those, those stations based on, on the chemical parameters, uh, the bio the bioturbation, the infauna colonization, and the sediment mixing, they all, they all work together. So then based on that, uh, we developed this conceptual model for uh, uh, geochemical, for biogeochemistry across the shelf as it relates to uh, bioturbation and sediment chemistry. So near the east part, eastern shelf near the delta, sediments are largely depositional. Um, we had some, some in fauna, but they, they get buried, so they're buried. And most of the cycling there is primarily manganese cycling. That's likely link, linked to organic matter decomposition. A lot of manganese, the sediments are turning, they're being oxidized, so depositional. Uh, the inshore uh, stress uh, band in gray is, uh, uh, that's the region that's mostly so where most of the sulfitic sediments are. Uh, the mixing is poorly colonized, a lot of physical mixing. And offshore, the offshore band are uh, sediments where there's high amounts of bioturbation, uh, high amounts of oxidized iron, uh, sulfate reduction rates are low. Um, and then uh, the inshore is kind of like a, or the middle part is the transition of sorts from the inshore to the offshore. So we think that, you know, that sets it up and that uh, these follow more of the offshore, inshore to offshore uh, uh, distribution than from east to west as far as the geochemical parameters going in the shelf. So this is, um, yeah, so this is just out. Um, but I think the, uh, um, there haven't been many studies that have looked at the effects of uh, the bioturbation, the sediment, and uh, the biogeochemical rates over such a large expanse of, of uh, continental shelf. 
All right, so what do we find out? Uh, yeah, you know, the limb fauna were different. Uh, the biogeochemicals differed. The in fauna with their sediment mixing, you know, again, it's the OMB composition has a larger component from oxygen and then also uh, the metals. And inshore, no mixing, a lot of uh, sulfate reduction. And uh, near shore to offshore, relationship as far as uh, the patterns of electron receptors go. And then we were also able to delineate this uh, depositional zone of manganese cycling near the delta. Okay, so this was our, our papers just out this month. Um, so all the co-authors collaborated on this, and then we had some, you know, some more people from our, our lab who went out on the, the boat to help process these samples. Let's see. I think I can get through this real fast. I, we're not, this is some, some data that came out of um, the 2010 cruise, and then some, some uh, uh, microbial community analysis we did based on 16S RNA. And going to try to make, uh, I don't think we can show what these pathways for anoxic uh, ammonium oxidation will be, but I think we can propose some, uh, make some hypotheses and best guess as to what the pathways might actually be. But this is uh, ammonium uh, nitrogen cycle. And in the middle, where NO is, you have the Animox reaction. This was described in 1995 as a reaction. Basically, you get ammonium reacting with nitrite, and that goes to, to nitrogen gas and, and is uh, basically a sink for nitrogen in the environment. And again, this you know came up in 1995 and uh, kind of set up a new paradigm for how nitrogen is cycled in, in the environment. During our cruises, um, so we took a core and we, you know, sliced them up right away. And this is in 2010. And then we had another set of cores that we incubated uh, overnight to a couple of days, and we cut those up. And then we had cores that went for, for over 40 days like this. Um, the red, these are our nit nitrite, nitrate concentrations. And there's a, a decrease in most of these uh, across stations, but I think it's just really surprising that they're there at all. Um, so nitrate is a, a very favorable uh, electron acceptor, so it should be used up. So there's something either um, preventing nitrate reduction or nitrate respiration, or there's real fast cycling of this, so any nitrate being made is, is being replaced. Um, so the, you know, the primary place that would come from would be from oxidation of ammonium. Ammonium in these cores can be really high, like 500 millimolar. So we wanted to explore that. And these are, yeah, these are cores that went for 40 days. This looks at the nitrite. They're very low concentrations, but our analyses was uh, good enough that, that we have a lot of confidence in these. Um, in cores, some cores, basically the, the nitrite concentrations are low, but they increase over 40 days from, from the first day we collected the cores. And so let's try to figure out what's going on there. Um, so here are, here are possibilities for ammonium oxidations, you know, without uh, the ammonium oxidation. So of course, you know, at the top, you, Typical uh, oxidation with oxygen. Uh, it's been shown the Animox is the second one with nitrate. Uh, some work showing uh, you can oxidize ammonium with uh, manganese oxide. So this is, you know, what they would call suboxic. So there shouldn't be any, there won't be any oxygen with iron and uh, iron oxides. Uh, sulfate reductions with sulfate. The uh, 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 
methane can also be oxidized anaerobically by, by this process. It's, in that, that case, it's a, a relationship between actually a methanogen and a sulfate reducer, and the methane run cycle runs backwards, and they use the sulfate. And with natural organic matter at the bottom, so they, there are uh, quinolines in the organic matter, like humic acids and the like, and they can get also be reduced um, for ammonium oxidation. So these are the possible pathways. And then finally, this one is uh, cable bacteria. These are, I should, oh, I meant to add a, a, a real picture of the cable bacteria. This is a, a diagram. These are bacteria, They're, they belong to a sulfate reducing family called sulfobulbacy. And these are, are filamentous cell and they, and they stack up like this end to end. And they uh, basically cross uh, uh, biogeochemical zones. So uh, the cathode is up in the oxygenated water and then the nano down further into the sediments. And they use, they're able to uh, uh, transport or conduct electrons uh, from in, down in the sediment uh, to oxygen in the water and oxidized sulf sulfide. And so these are, uh, you know, like in the last couple of years these came out. And I don't know, it's hard to say how quantitatively important these are, you know, as far as uh, sulfide oxidation or uh, these guys are proposing uh, ammonium oxidation here. Uh, so primarily at, at the anode, you know, if they can sh shuttle electrons uh, out like they do for sulfide, then that would be a possibility. So what we so again, we have the 16 sRNA sequences kind of parsed out the different kinds of bacteria that might uh, be able to participate in those kind of reactions. And again, these are in the sediments. The left column is uh, our uh, uh, 16 sRNA sequences related to uh, nitrosum, uh, nitrosum pumilus. That's the uh, archaeobacteria that oxidizes ammonium with oxygen to nitrite. And uh, you know, oxidizes ammonium with oxygen to nitrite. And so far, they're described as uh, anaero aerobes. And in our sediments over here on uh, the left, uh, for example, at CO2, we have a, a peak below the ARPD, which is that line there, which suggests probably some, some anaerobic capacity. The uh, triangles are uh, sulfide oxidizer called thiobranum. And uh, this is a uh, chemolithotroph, so it basically gets all of its energy uh, that it needs for growth from chemical reactions. It doesn't use organic matter. And this, like the trosopumilus, are, are chemolithotrophs. So I think we're using this here to show where, you know, in the sediments you might find some chemolithotrophic activity. Um, and the middle ones are the, the classical uh, ammonium oxidizers, nitrosococcus and nitrosospira. Uh, it's in the telling in the uh, at AO5. There's uh, a big peak of nitrospira again below the sediments. Now nitrospira can reduce sulfate, so we don't it's probably we don't know that it's actually oxidizing ammonia under there by any kind of a pathway. Um, so it, you know finding it down there is okay. But we had low sulfate reduction rates there, and there's a lot of, and those sediments have a lot of manganese and iron. So that, that could be a possibility. And then over on the, on the right here, uh, uh, the diamonds are, are, are SEEP, S-O-S-R-B. So these are at uh, uh, methane seeps, and these are the sulfate reducers that were associated with the manthanogens that oxidized methane anaerobically. So we have those there. The, the sulfobulbous OTU is uh, the closest relative we could find to the cable bacteria, and it's just basically showing where, where they might exist if they were in the sediments. But they're very low, so I don't think that uh, the cable bacteria are important. These are the other stations. Um, Let's see, 
up at FO4, um, that's the one where we had a lot of sulfate reduction. Remember the, the uh, iron, that poor water iron and manganese decreased in that area. So we see the thiogranum decreasing there as well. So it's probably not a good place for sulfide oxidizers. And uh, FO7 shows in the center the uh, uh, nitrosococcus and nitrosomonas, probably oxidizing ammonia there. And HO4, uh, some really nice peaks above the ARPD. All right. So these are the possible mechanisms, I think, are, are reactions. We don't know, could be uh, abiotic reactions. We don't think the cable bacteria are involved. Uh, there's still a lot of manganese and iron uh, in these cores, so that could possibly be a pathway and then always difficult to rule out uh, organic matter. All right, so I'm gonna stop here. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here and take some questions.